Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to our Conversations program. My name is Emily Butler. I'm the Conversations Curator here at Art Basel. We're really delighted to be welcoming two leading artists today, Zineb Sidira and Latifa Ekcac, who are both representing France and Switzerland at the Venice Biennale this year. But they're also representing many other communities and also a community of friends. Zineb and Latifa have a joint exhibition, which is currently on at the Kunsthaus Baseland. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition yet, I highly recommend it during your stay in Basel. The exhibition is curated by Ines Goldbach, who's here with us today. And we wish to thank uh, Kunsthaus Baseland for their collaboration on bringing the event to you today. And also to the uh, Institut Francais and the French Embassy in Switzerland for supporting the exhibition. Um, sadly, Zoe Whitley, uh, who is due to moderate the conversation, is not with us today, but we're delighted that Colleen Milliard, who's the executive editor at Art Basel, has stepped in and will be moderating the talk today. The talk will last approximately 50 minutes. We have 10 minutes for questions at the end. We'll be passing a mic around for the questions. And for the audiences who are watching online, please feel free to pop questions in the chat, and I'll try and relay some of them at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the conversation. Please give, uh, give our speakers a very warm round of applause and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's a very wonderful introduction. I, I have to say today is a very, very special conversation because not only you two are peers, artist peers, but you're also friends. And we're also friends. So this is really a story of friendship. I think, Zineba, I've known you since 2010, when I curated your exhibition at uh, the Musée d'Art Contemporain in Marseille, your first retrospective in France. Latifa, I met you even before, when I was an intern, and you were showing your postgraduate um, projects in the early noughts, and I've followed your work with admiration ever since. We got to know each other a little bit later. And now we're all in Basel. You have a duo show at the Kunsthaus Baselland entitled For a Brief Moment Several Times, which, as Emily said, I highly recommend you go and visit. Which, for someone who might not know your work intimately, might feel like an immersive installation. We kind of almost wonder a time where one work finishes and the other starts. And look, really, going through the exhibition yesterday, I was reminded that this really feels like a testimony to the trust that you place in each other, and of course, to your friendship. Therefore, the friendship is going to be the running theme through this conversation. We'll be talking, of course, of the extraordinary pavilions that you two produce for the Venice Biennale. We'll touch on some of the themes that run through your practice. And of course, discuss the show at the Kunsthaus Baselland. But before we go there, I just wanted to ask you, how did you meet? OK. Um, I think I've, I was aware of Latifa's work um, for a very long time. Um, we had an exhibition together, but we didn't meet each other because we didn't go physically to the show. And it was in Perigueux in France, yeah? Uh, Zoe yeah. Gray, the curator at the time. And we're talking about which year that was. It was in 2004, five, something like that. Maybe six. Six, already. yeah. And then we were lucky to meet for the first time in New York. Yes. When we had a show um, called, we participated, participated in a very important feminist show called Global Feminism at the Brooklyn Museum. Yeah. And that's where I, for the first time, met you physically. Let's yeah, it was a show curated by Yimura Riley and Neil, Linda Nocklin, and we met. It, we met in New York. It was really funny for me like, to meet like, Zineb in New York because we were like, both like, in France related and, uh, and uh, never catch a moment like, to, to, to be really uh, presented. And I know her work like, for a long time, of course, and uh, that was a work that really speak to me a lot. Like, it was for me a way also to, to, can, to be able to identify myself in the art scene like, because like, at that moment there was like, not so many um, uh, uh, artists like originally from uh, North Africa in the scene, and uh, for me she was like one of my example. And, uh, so and so we met in New York, like <laughs> normal. And the rest, as they say, is, is history, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then we kept contact and friendship, yeah. and then you had that show at the Tate, yeah. modern in. And 
in 2008, and you opened a show in power plant. Yeah, in a uh, whooping project. Yeah, yeah. power station. Of, yeah. yeah, power station in a... Yeah, and... Um, yeah. The story of exhibitions and the story of, of art. So, the, this concept really runs through not only you know, your, your life story, but of course the work that you did in Venice. And you'll see in the background some of the images of, of Zineb's work in Le Chiefs Pavilion in, in Venice, but as well as some images from the, the Kunsthaus. Zineb, I'll start with you. Um, you represent France at the Venice Biennale this year. You're the first artist from Algerian descent to represent France. And I think for anyone who follows French politics, even from, from very far, this is, this is quite significant. The pavilion is curated by Yasmina Regad, Sam Bardawil and Til Faris, who are uh, the director of the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. And it features installations, performances, and a film called Dreams Have No Title. Not everyone has had a chance to see your pavilion yet, so perhaps you could start by describing it for the audience. Okay, so um, when I was nominated, I was, it was announced that I was going to represent France. That was, I think, in January 2020, just before the confinement, the first lockdown. I was asked by the French Institute quite quickly to provide a little text about the work I wanted to do. And straight away for me, I had to do something that kind of related to the Mostra of Venice. I knew I wanted to do something around the cinema and, of course, the Mostra of Venice, the Festival uh, du, du Cinéma à Venise. Was, was going to be an important uh, element to it. Why? Because I remember throughout my research and when I did the project at the Jeu de Paume, a lot of my research at the Cinematheque of Algiers, I came across the story of the Battle of Algiers, the film by Gilo Potonkovo, winning the Golden Lion in 1966 in Venice, and that created a big scandal and a, 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 a political uh, upheaval between France and Italy, because the, France saw, the French saw it as a, almost as a critique of colonization, of course it was somehow, but also because Yasef Sadi, who was the director of Casbah um, Production, which was a production company that produced the film, but was also playing his own role in the film, was for the French seen as a terrorist. Of course, for the Algerian and the Italian, he was seen as a freedom fighter. And it's always, I thought, quite interesting, this notion of wherever you are from or the position you are in, you are the freedom fighter of terrorists. Anyway, so I thought of the Golden Lion that was given to that, the scandal created in France, and, but still knowing that in France there was also a lot of militant film, films made and anti-colonial uh, film made. So I decided to concentrate my project on this triangulaire, that tri triangle between Italy, France, and Algeria, and how Algeria in the 60s, post-independence, were putting a lot of money and commissioning a lot of films by, of course, Algerian filmmakers, but many Italian, French, uh, and American. I mean, the most well-known one is perhaps the William Klein film, the, uh, the Pan-African Festival of 1969. Of course, the Battle of, of Alger, you know, but many other, Z by Costa Gavras, uh, Elise Oudavrevi, Michel Drac, uh, Visconti, um, L'Etranger, Le Bal Hétéroscolaire, just to name a few films that were co-produced with Algeria and were, uh, had a character or uh, an element of militantism mm -hmm. in the work. So that was going to be my project. So I decided to make a film about film. I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, so of course, the mise en abîme idea came through. So I made a film about films, I made a film about filmmakers and about those three countries and the militant cinema of the 60s, what we call the tiers mondis cinema. We will call it today the Global South uh, Cinema. And, uh, and then I shot a film in 16 mil. I used the French pavilion as a film studio. For me, it was very important to break this idea of the pavilion and make it a film studio. So I shot all my film there, built all the decor, the accessories, everything was then in the French pavilion in January. And we left everything. So we shot the film, took the film back to Paris, obviously, and then left all the decors, the accessories, the costumes, everything that was connected to the film, the lighting, the cameras, everything was left there as a trace of, of a film which just has been shot. And of course, I made a film that you can see in the pavilion, and I recreated the cinema of my childhood, of Jean Villiers, uh, size, you know, exactly the same size, you see an image here. And in that cinema, I uh, projected the film that I made. So when you enter the pavilion, you enter a bar 
where two dancers are dancing, and they are the characters from the Pontakova film, the Bal. Yeah. From, uh, is that right? Um, Etorisco Laf. Etorisco Laf, Bal, the Bal. Yeah. And you see them. In the film, we see you dancing that very scene. So we have these moments of repetition between, between what you see in the performance, what you see in the film. Of course, we recognize the film sets in the film itself. Yeah. So there's a constant kind of back and forth between yeah. the film it, and the installation. It is important to say that a lot of the film is based on remakes from those films from the 60s and 70s. For me to include this film, I could have used clips of the film and put them in my film, but I decided to recreate the decor. For example, for the Battle of Algiers, it is a decor of the scene of the lady when she bleached her hair before she goes and put the bomb in the bar. Mm. So for each film, for the scene you just mentioned, it's that beautiful scene. I mean, the whole film, Le Bar, and Le Bar is around a bar. Mm. Uh, it's in a nightclub. And so there is that scene with, uh, with uh, that lady that everyone was saying look like me, and the only Algerian actor that plays in the film I chose the scene where he plays, and I asked my friend Faisal Bakrish, who's also an artist of Algerian background, to uh, play the scene. So we rehearsal, I included all my friends and a lot of curators, my curators of the French Pavilion, to play, and each was given a very particular role to play. Yasmina Regad, she played the, 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 the role of the, the lady who wish her in the Battle of Algiers. Till, uh, Till plays the role of uh, F.O. Fake by Orson Welles. So most of all the films were connecting to Algeria, about two. Uh, Soy Kuba and F.O. Fake. They were chosen by me not because they were produced with Algeria, but because I like the aesthetic and also because of the militant uh, um, content somehow. But the idea of the remake, the mise en album and the making of, because I also film the film being made, so all that is mixed up in, the, um, in my own film. Plus, of course, a film that I was, uh, that, uh, with the help of the Cinematheque of Bologna, we restored. I was looking everywhere for 1964 Algerian film by an uh, Italian uh, filmmaker called Emali by Ennio Lorenzini. And uh, it was lost for 60 years. I find it in Rome, in an archive, and with the help of the Cinematheque of Bologna. We actually restored it, and it will be premiere after 60 years in Bologna in three weeks' time, and I'm going to present it. So in my film, you see that film, you know, uh, cutting through the whole narrative of the film. Mm -hmm. And of course, in your film, we also see Latifa, who is an actor in, in your film, like so many yeah. of your friends. So maybe, Latifa, you could tell us a few words about how was the experience <laughs> of being not the, the artist, but the actor, in that sense. Yeah, it's, uh, I am a very discreet person. Normally, I don't like to show uh, up myself. But uh, when uh, Zineb asked me like, to act and to play uh, 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 this character, I, I said, of course, yes, I can transform myself just by friendship. It was important. And um, so it was also nice to, to be, you know, in January in Venice, we were like installing as crazy. I was like full of dust and uh, burned things and everything. So, and then I had to, you know, to go to be makeup. Uh, somebody take care of my hair. I was dressed, and so that was a very, a very nice moment. Nice moment. And also, it's uh, the thing I understand. It's also that. Um, uh, the way to handle a story on how we can remake it uh, to have another or different lecture or to go much more deeper into things. And uh, I think it's really all that we do as an artist, uh, as a Sonia uh, Boyce, as, a, as, a, as, as also many people uh, involved in the film. And uh, yeah, I just act. <laughs> I mean, your own pavilion is it also kind of touches on, on performance, but of another kind. It's entitled The Concert, mm -hmm. and it starts really outside already. I think we, we encounter burned wood and little ash, little pieces of, oops, sorry, I'm losing my mind. Right, um, that should be better. So we encounter this burn, burn wood, and then as we progress, we see remnant of sculptures, half burn, and we continue towards the center of the pavilion where finally we discover these wooden effigies which are not touched, unburned. So as if we're kind of going through the process in reverse. In the middle of the, of the pavilion, they are based in this beautiful orange light which looks like fire or sunset. And we kind of feel like something happened that we're kind of retracing, but we just don't really, really know what. 
And funnily enough, this pavilion is also very much a story of friendship. You worked with a composer, Alexandre Babel, and the curator, Francesco Stocchi. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about this collaboration and how it came to be. Yeah, everything, everything starts with a, with a question. When I met uh, Alexandre Babel, it was in, a, in the jury I was part of in a Labec residency in La Tour de Paix. And uh, we uh, have to select like musician, artist, designer, and architect that work uh, uh, in this field of Anthropocene and uh, technologies and uh, uh, on things. And I met him at that, uh, at that moment. But in the beginning, I was like very distant. He was a musician. I was an artist. It was very clear. The, I, there, were, there was like so many things that I didn't know how he knew it. And, uh, and then the first evening, I understand that we have like a lot of things in common in music, uh, in the music field. That uh, uh, think that I thought that people like him who do like a very classical background of music, and uh, uh, he was like aware about. Uh, you know, like uh, Ryoji Keda, Mika Vanyo, and uh, uh, Terry Temlitz, and so we were like uh, comparing all these things. I was very surprised. And then the second jury, then I start to be more shy <laughs> and to ask, the, ask him a question. And I was just wondering like how he process, like how he do when you have to project uh, uh, an idea of something that he will do. Uh, do he, uh, he, I was wondering if we write music before we play it, uh, if we think about something, but what, in which way. It was full of questions for me. Me as an artist, I know how I work. I have a space, I imagine, I have the specialization, I have the display, the, 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 uh, the, the walk through, I have the frame and all that, the materiality, the color, the sequences in a way. And that I know, but for music, I don't know. So it, it started with this question. And then a few uh, months after, like maybe two or three months after, I was invited for the, to do the competition for the, for the Swiss Pavilion. And then I thought, OK, maybe I will start with this question, the last question I had. Um, how uh, can I make just a project that I will experiment at, uh, an art exhibition like a concert? So, I want people to feel like in the same way, to have the art bit uh, transformed, to have like fragments of memory, all this feeling that we have after a concert. I wanted to to give that to the to the audience, mm -hmm. uh, to the public. So it starts in that way. So by a, this crazy question, I, I took two days to find that uh, point of entrance of the project, and then I call Alexandre, and. Um, uh, and then I called Francesco Stocchi. Uh, we did just a, a, a show in a Fondation Memo in Rome. And during the process, we were like um, uh, talking about music and making stuff very late in the evening, eating pizza after. And uh, so I thought that, and I understand that he revealed uh, that before he was a DJ of the music. So I thought that maybe for a curator, art historian, that was a DJ of the, the music, maybe he could be the best one to understand where I want to go or, or what I want to produce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so it was uh, the, the thing. And I mean, yourself, you, you, you actually shifted position yeah. for this project. I mean, you said recently that you wanted to position yourself as a musician, mm -hmm. reinvent how you approach an exhibition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did this process kind of do to the project itself? Yeah, it was. Uh, so now we are. It's done. We can talk in a very different way. I needed the, at that time. I needed a, bre a break in my career. I need to. I needed to. You know, to go and read books again. To rediscover uh, things in a very fresh way, uh, uh, like if it was the beginning. So, I really, I really wanted to have a break just to 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 figure out where I, I am and where I can uh, follow my way. How I can follow my way and to have time also to digest uh, everything that was going may maybe very far, uh, fastly and, uh, and far before. And uh, so uh, for me, it was a good way to have a break of myself as an artist. I said, okay, now I will be, will be like a musician. It means that I put myself in the situation of discovering everything from zero, in a way from zero. Uh, I heard a lot of music before, but I never really 
uh, get very deep into that. Even if I use it in several uh, exhibitions I did, like in, uh, in Kassel, uh, uh, in Frédéric Sanun in Kassel, uh, I did a piece with a composer uh, of uh, dodecaphony music with a quarter-ton piano. And uh, I was really aware of that, but I, know, I never went deeper. And uh, so for me, it was a way to learn everything. And uh, like if I was like 20 year old, uh, 20 year old uh, just out of an art school, and I have to discover everything again, and to be enthusiastic about, oh, that's so amazing, how the history, the philosophy, the techniques, uh, how it's involved in the body. And a then, complete fresh start for you, a yeah. whole new way to, to start. And then it's uh, give me, it didn't change my work but it changed uh, the consciousness I have of it. Mm -hmm. It's mean that I understand so many things about myself just by a musical point of view. I understand the way I was like, why I destroy things, how I always edited uh, things in the reverse way, or how I deal with the linearity of a, narrativ uh, of a narrativity, and uh, all the things, it was really uh, part uh, of the music thing. Also, the polyphony uh, make me understand how I put like several layers of lecture in the same uh, surface. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in the painting or in the installation, it's the same thing. You have like different gesture, very opposite sometimes, and you can have it all in the same, uh, the same uh, moment, presentness. And that I understand it with, uh, with music. It's also something you share with Zineb because there's this work of editing, of putting things together, of creating something new from found sources. It's also very, very much at the, at the heart of, of what you do, Zineb. And I'm thinking now of your incredible vinyl collection at the Kunsthaus, for example, or the collages that you did about the Pan, the Pan African um, cinema. So what, what happens when we put things together in, in a different way? I mean, I am, a, I am a collector in that kind of, a, not an art collector, obviously, but a collector of objects. And I go to a lot of flea markets and to a second-hand shop and, and I buy, yeah, I buy objects and vinyls, it's one of them, but also it could be furniture, it could be vases or whatever. And of course, one period of time that I like is the 60s, 70s, so I buy a lot of music from that time or whatever. And uh, like a lot of collectors, I guess you want to show your collection to everyone. And when you want to show your collection to everyone, you have to learn to edit the mm -hmm. collection you have. And in my case, I think with a collage, for me, that was a perfect medium because then you can add a lot of bits. The same with the vinyl. And with the film, I realized with the film, it's also a kaleidoscope, also a collage of a lot of different scenes that appear to not be connected. But when you put them in the film, you have to make them connect. In some ways, I told the object I buy in vintage shop, they all connect somehow, I'm the connection somehow. Um, so I love yes, this idea of editing, putting together, decide that that works better than other. But there is another aspect for me, which is very important, is the sharing of knowledge. I do a lot of uh, research in archives. Uh, so the one in Europe, it's not so much a problem because everyone can access them, but the one in Algeria, it's much more difficult. And I was so lucky to have almost carte blanche at the Cinematheque of Algiers which is an amazing, amazing space where you see amazing documents, films, objects, uh, books, uh, receipts, everything there. And I thought to myself, I mean, you know, I'm probably the one who was able to access it and probably that will be the last time. I realized that I was so lucky that it will, you know, it will probably not last. So I thought I want to share with people what I find in the Cinematheque of Algiers about the Pan-African Festival of 69. And this is a project I'm showing here with Latifa. And by putting even just bits of text or, or clip of press or whatever in the collage, some I'm sharing, I'm sharing what I found. And for me, it's very important. It's again about transmission, uh, sharing. It's about, you know, getting out of the dark some new elements or some information that are, you know, I want people really to be able to access. It's about accessibility mm -hmm. somehow. And of course, it's about memory, how things are remembered, how they're told. I mean, I think that is also something that runs very much in both of your work in different ways. Um, I think maybe Latifa, you could tell us a little bit what, about your work at the Kunsthaus, because they're very much about memory. Describe them for us, for those who haven't seen them yet, and how does that relate to the things that we remember, but also the things that we forget? 
Exactly. The, the, the display is very like simple object that everybody can recognize. You have like uh, several carpets, and uh, in, on each carpet you have some objects on it. And uh, everything is uh, full of uh, black ink, only uh, but the one of uh, the circle in the, in the space uh, that you have like the original color. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like um, I put it in, I went for it in different angle. Once was how to do a still life with objects. So I use a carpet as uh, a scene, uh, like a, theatralic, uh, theat a theater scene. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have the, the display, but not the character, not the main character. And, uh, and then uh, uh, it's uh, the unlighted things. It's like the thing that you unlight, but it's also like a spotlight that you can see moving from one carpet to the other. And uh, so um, and that's for each one. And then for the ensemble of the, of the work, uh, it's like if you have the light moving from one piece to the other, and you have some elements that you found that are identical and some are different. And uh, all that is, uh, was uh, my question is how we remember uh, the first uh, moment of a love story. And uh, so I tried to, to remember what was uh, the, um, uh, the point of memory that we can catch. Uh, for example, we all remember how, how we met our lover, and, uh, but uh, he was wearing a T-shirt or he was wearing a shirt. Uh, we were like drinking wine or fever tree. We was going to that concert. Uh, it was a Friday or the Saturday uh, in the festival uh, in, uh, in this uh, city. Uh, we were listening to that sound, uh, song, but also to the other one. Uh, I remember we have the telephone and with a speaker, but it was a, a booth speaker or a sono speaker. And, uh, and so it was an editing of a mixing of a memory. Because for me, memory is not fixed. Memory is super organic in a way. We can change it every time we are thinking back of some, some, some moment. We can change, we can twist, we can flip uh, the, the element. And uh, it, was a, it was a way to have this very intense uh, hormonal uh, heavy moment that fix everything that you happen to your, uh, in front of your eyes. Uh, but it's still movable, like it's really movable. Uh, so it's a way how we can re-edit a memory. And the project I did, in, it was in 2019 in Vire uh, in, in Bruxelles. Mm. Um, and it was a few months before I start to work for the project for the Biennale. Mm -hmm. So then I passed from that project to, to the one of the, of, the, of the pavilion. And I also saw your exhibition in London recently at Pace Gallery, where you have these night scenes um, of young people in yes. a club and some of the, the image is partly obstructed, so we, we see fragments. Yes. Uh, so it's almost like the, the day after what, what happened. Yeah, what, it's, what happened. Uh, yeah it's always uh, the, the day after, but it's al also how you feel uh, reality. Like it's something that, uh, um, how you feel uh, something that is present. When you go to a party with some friend, you are so happy like of living this moment especially when there was a pandemic and I was missing all this uh, moment with my friends. Mm -hmm. And then I remember like you, you have always when you are living a nice moment, you also have to be clear that this, you know that this moment will be gone forever. And you know that you are losing exactly what you are like enjoying at that time. So it's always this polyphony of feeling between the sadness and uh, the, the, the joy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really always that, that I want to be um, clear and uh, not naive. And we, we really have to, to, to deal with this both opposite feeling in the same time. Mm. Another opposite that is, of course, very present in those moments is a tension between the collective, the fact that many people are experiencing that moment, and the very private. Yeah. And, and I guess this is also something we find in your work, where you tackle these grand historical narratives sometimes to deconstruct them or to propose new one or unearth some that got forgotten sometimes on, on purpose. But of course, through your work, there's also something which is very intimate, 
which is about your life, which is about your friends, again. And I'm thinking in particular of this piece that you're showing currently at the Kunsthaus, Baseland, which is for a brief moment, the world was on fire and we have come back. This is a piece from 2019 that you first show at the, I showed at the Jeux de Pomme. And basically, it's a recreation of your living room in your apartment in London, in Brixton, a living room that I know very well because I've spent many hours in it. We worked in it, we drank in it, we danced in it, we had a lot of things. And I'm only one of a constellation of people who've been through, through that space. What's extraordinary and what really moving for me personally was that, of course, the living room becomes a character in your film in, in the French pavilion in Venice. And you have Ghislaine Tawadros and, and Sonia Boyce having a conversation about Brixton shot in your living room, which we found now at the Cons House Basel. In the living room. Exactly. So we have all this kind of this cycle and this moment that we, we find again and again. Could you tell us a little bit about that space of the living, living room? room. Well, when I did the whole project around the Pan-African Festival of 1969 in Algiers, I, um, of course, I thought uh, a festival, it's a place uh, full of culture and music, and uh, so, so, you know, Algeria was hosting at the time all the African country, but, and beyond that, to come and visit Algeria, to spend time, to, to play there, either in theater plays, show films, mm -hmm. uh, music, there was a very strong component. Of music. I'm just thinking, for people who don't know anything about the Festival Pan-Africain, can you just tell us in two words how did it happen and why it okay. was so important? So in, uh, there was a first festival that happened in Dakar in 1966, where it was the first, one of the first festivals were happening in an African country, talking perhaps about colonization. Um, and then in 1969, obviously Algeria decolonized itself in 62. In 1969, Algeria is uh, chosen in the African League to uh, host the next uh, festival after uh, the Dakar one. And uh, so Algeria does something different from the Dakar one, where by they invite all the African countries about uh, being decolonized or just decolonized, but goes beyond that by inviting also the Palestinian, the Lebanese, the um, Vietnamese, the Cuban, and the civil rights movement in America. Uh, and I'm just like really giving few names uh, of people who were there because there was many more. The Sp Spanish were there because they were under Franco, the Portuguese were there because they were under fascism. So all those um, liberation or militant groups were invited also to be in Algeria as part of the festival. So not only the festival was about culture and music, but it was about discussion. It was a discursive space, and there is actually an amazing catalog that you can see when you go and see the show that shows a symposium that happened uh, that summer in Algeria where all the people that came and, and discussed the politic of how culture basically can help to decolonize, decolonize oneself. Um, so, and the idea was, and Boumediene, who was at the time the president of Algeria, the, the idea was you can only free yourself from colonization if you go back to the roots and the culture and the tradition of one's country. So Hans invited all those people to come and do, you know, different performance, art exhibition, etc. But as I said, there was also all those groups who were there that the, the state of Algeria was uh, hosting and paying, um, you know, for them to stay, you know, like the Black Panthers they stayed two years in Algeria at the time, etc., etc. Many groups stayed for many, many long beyond the, the festival. So for me, the festival was a space of, of dancing, music, etc., and laughter and food, blah, 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 but it was also a place of discussion. And I thought the best way for me to represent on a small, smaller scale the Pan-African Festival was a living room, because a living room is a place where you host people, you might dance, have a party, you might uh, uh, bring up your kids there, watch a film, uh, etc. There is a lot of all those activities, you listen to music, I've got a big collection of vinyl, so I play that in my living room, etc., etc. So I thought my living room, which is on the top of that, totally furnished 1960s, somehow made sense to be there. As a, so yes, we recreated exactly the size of my living room as a diorama, but all the furniture came from my living room. So I had to give away all my furniture, all my objects. So with all the traces and uh, uh, from my life with the kids, you know, as a mother, blah, 
in there. And of course, the story of Brixton, because I live in Brixton in South London. The story in Brixton, for people who don't know in London, is also a, a, a story uh, in the 60s of counterculture. So the whole project is about uh, counterculture. And Brixton was well known. The, the, Black, the British Black Panthers were uh, based in, in Brixton, et cetera, et cetera. So it made sense somehow to have my living room as an example of or a, a micro mini uh, Pan-African festival somehow with a lot of kind of uh, conversations that happen. With the TV, you're right, there is a monitor. When you go now in Venice, where you see Sonia and Gillian, Sonia Boyce, by the way, who's representing Britain uh, in Venice, and Gillian talking about what it meant to be in Brixton. Because Sonia Boyce and I were also neighbors for 10 years in Brixton, and she spent a lot of time in my living room. So, you know, there is a, yeah. But for me, I think this idea of the living room, you see it here, is I thought was a, almost a paroxysm of doing autobiographical work. You couldn't be more autobiographical than that because this everything, all the furniture has the traces, the, the stain that the kids must have left, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then the piece of Venice came, the film, and then I realized, oh my God, it's a film about me. So literally the film is about, of course, the cinema of the 60s, but within that, there is a lot of me. Me playing in it, me talking about it, about the biggest story, but the smaller stories also. So I always think that I've almost done, I can't go beyond, above that kind of personal work, but then I find another one which is even more personal. But I guess this is what I do. But you said earlier, and I really am going to bounce off that, you said, like, I guess the connector is me talking about all these objects. And I think, Latifa, also in your, in your rugs, you have this collection of these objects that are, I understand, also quite personal. And that love story is also quite personal. So you have, in fact, put perhaps more of yourself directly in this piece than you do in some of other works of, of that we know of yours, where you tackle the history or something, which feels a little bit less directly related to, to your own autobiography. Yeah. When I, when I did, the, for example, the exhibition in Saint Pompidou in uh, 2014, I collect back uh, objects from my childhood. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and I remember because maybe the difference is that I have no object from my childhood at all. My parents move, they, uh, my mother like, took in the garbage everything. I do not have the super vinyl collection of my father that was a lot of uh, uh, involved into music. So me, I have to found back uh, from memory, like the object, uh, this special lamp, these special things, uh, this special um, uh, uh, soup pot, uh, this special... Uh, uh, bibelot and uh, fl uh, plastic flower and, uh, and all that. So uh, I also a collector of, uh, of uh, vintage objects, but it's really from, uh, it's like if I have to classify uh, what could be um, an heritage of, uh, of uh, object wood uh, that, I, that I experiment uh, in the past. And, uh, uh, so it's very pleasant to do that because like that you have an excuse to go to flea market yeah. to tra when you travel. Every time I travel, I found back some stuff. And, uh, and then when you see an object uh, that related to your childhood or your past, you recognize it immediately. Uh, I remember this emotion to see like the same kind of this, yeah, the same lamp that was a coquillage, a, sh uh, a shell with a fish from Valoris. And that's... I was so happy to find it. It was exactly the same that we have uh, in the uh, furniture uh, of the when you have the TV above. And I remember in, then after uh, in 2018, I found it back in Rome in the flea market, the same lamp, uh, a Valoris shell uh, with the fish, and then I include that in the in the concrete uh, uh, organic piece I did uh, for the Fondation Memo. And. Uh, that's that's uh, that's something that was really uh, that is really uh, interesting. But m most of all, I built my memory with my with my loss. Uh, I have no heritage. I I don't feel that I really have a culture. That is very sad to say that. But I I was always in between two cultures. But it means that it's like in in between two share. 
you, ha you are nowhere, you are sitting in the floor. <laughs> and uh, it's exactly this uh, thing that's how to, 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 um, to define yourself by identity that I don't have. So I have to find my space in between this uh, um, uh, uh, absence of uh, localization. So that was uh, something that was sad uh, for my life. Uh, but then after developing my art practice, I found that it was really my strength because then to be nowhere means that you are like You're everywhere. <laughs> you can be everywhere. And uh, not uh, fixed. Uh, it's a freedom that I uh, really experiment. And then um, uh, I can uh, uh, wonder much more things. I can. Uh, uh, put in suspicion much more uh, position that for me I, I, I feel never that uh, a position is a position. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a position you can, you can um, really uh, 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 interrogate it in a suspicious way. Why? Are you sure that you are there? And uh, it's, it's exactly this in-between things that uh, means that you have a, a failure, a, a physical failure when you can uh, travel and understand the mechanism uh, itself. Mm. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you say that, that from a place of, uh, of, of being nowhere, from a place of loss, you can create something new. And I think both of you look toward the past a lot. But what was very striking in the text that Ines wrote, and I invite you to read it, it's a beautiful text, she reminds her readers that you're not nostalgic. This is not about kind of moaning the loss of the past. It's about creating another space, and I, and I quote here, to act and shape tomorrow. I felt that this is really encapsulate very much both of your project in a way, starting from the past, but looking towards the future. I don't know if you want to react, maybe in at first. Uh, but it's also about uh, not forgetting, mm -hmm. you know, it's about not forgetting the past, especially when the past could have been, I mean, you know, if, if we talk, about the Pan-African Festival and that moment, that 60s moment, that didn't just happen in Algeria, actually, and that happened all over the world with many movements that happened. During, they were all very powerful and strong. Some of them failed, but that doesn't mean because they failed at the time that we can't look back at them and try to reconstruct perhaps better, you know? And for me, so it's about not forgetting those moments who were very powerful. I mean, you know, yeah. So, uh, and we're always searching new ways of, 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 of fighting back something. So perhaps not, why not look at what failed or what happened in the past in order to better move forward. That's the way I, uh, I see things. Mm -hmm. And it's also what you built when you are together in this memory that we share also, like uh, uh, for, the, for the concert uh, project, it was that we, <coughs> how, what it is when we are together in a concert, we all uh, move with the same rhythm. Mm. We are sharing the same experience, and uh, and but you are alone, but part of a crowd. You are like really like a multitude at that at this precise moment that you are living an event, and then you go back home and you are like alone, mm. and you are just have your memory. So what stay after a collective moment that you feel that everything is possible? Mm -hmm. You can move everything, and then you go back home and. You are alone and, and you ca still carry this uh, potentiality of uh, doing a revolution. <laughs> the potentiality of a revolution seems like a wonderful moment to actually open to the audience. I'm sure that we have lots of questions for you. So, Emilia, I will see if you can send the mic around. Of course, if there's no question, we can continue for hours. So. I've got a question. Um, it seems that you're both looking at this question of gaps and fragments, maybe, from different angles. So you, perhaps, Neb, looking at the archive and looking at the fragments that emerge from the archive. And you, Latifa, you're looking at, uh, perhaps, this question of rebirth and obliteration and what emerges um, under new spotlights. I, I had a question about, yeah, this idea of, of fallibility of, of memory and, um, and, yeah, what you're trying to do in this question of memory in your work. I thought we already answered that, but um, what can I add to that? Um... I, can, I, can, I can help, in a way, like, the, 
the memory is not fixed. <laughs> So we always have like to work on it. Uh, it means that you can work on it in a very intimate way, but you also we can work on it, on it in a very uh, more uh, um, um, aware way. And uh, for sure, when we have to deal with a uh, history, for example, the history of uh, 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 colonialism, immigration, then you understand that, OK, a story, you can still write it and rewrite it, and you can uh, always uh, uh, found some new angle of approaching. And for example, in France, uh, we had something that was attended in uh, uh, 2005. Uh, they decided, they thought of voting a law called the law of the 24 February 2005. And it was uh, the government that decided that the colonization could be seen in a positive way. Mm. That yeah. was something. So, and then we wait. Six months after, art, uh, the historians start to wake up and say, we cannot do that. What it means to have a posi positive way of seeing the colonization. And from that uh, uh, attempt of rereading the history in a positive way, uh, a lot of uh, uh, historians start to go back into uh, the, the, the research and the archive of the uh, immigration. Uh, and the movement was initiated by Pascal Blanchard, mm -hmm. and uh, they did a big uh, uh, symposium in Saint Pompidou at that time, uh, in 2006. And they, from that uh, symposium, you had like all the Ecole de Dakar, uh, you had uh, uh, like so many great. Uh, um, so many great uh, 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 speakers, and they, they finished to publish, uh, they did just after the publishing of a book called La Fracture uh, Coloniale, uh, the uh, colonial fracture. Uh, and, uh, and it was possible for the first time at that moment in France to have an attempt to really read uh, seriously this story. Before, there was only one book of Pascal Blanchard called uh, The L'Indigène à l'Immigré. Uh, I don't know, the, the, from the indigent to the immigrant. Mm -hmm. And it was in the uh, edition La Découverte. It was uh, 80 pages about that. Uh, then you had before a Malek Aloula uh, book uh, published in 91 about the Harem Colonial. Uh, it was published in France, edited in a very few uh, uh, number, sold out and uh, not available in French anymore, but it was still published in mid-press <laughs> in the US, but not in France. And you know, this rereading of history, it's something that historian, artist, art historian on every, 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 every uh, all of us have to be aware to do not forget the archive, to do not forget to remember, to reread on and, uh, and, uh, and everything. But also, and I think uh, as, as artists, mm. we're lucky to be able to play with the archive in a way that the historians, yes. art historian or historian, don't do, because I look yes. at documents and the content of the mm. text. We will look at the stain on the document, yeah. mm -hmm. where it's broken, yeah. why it's been uh, teared apart. The tear itself might be more interesting than the content of the text. Mm -hmm. So for us, we, we look for different clues who are more yeah. Uh, visual, I guess, yeah. and, and more three-dimensional sometimes. And because of that, it kind of rewrites or writes a different type of stories. Mm -hmm. And also, it, it's a uh, transgress or reappropriate uh, yes. uh, an official, if you want, stories. Um, mm -hmm. And I think for us, I think artists, mm -hmm. the ones who like going to the archives, that's what we like about, uh, you know, to break down that kind of the heaviness of the archive, the kind of... Uh, but you know. uh, also, like did uh, Zaya Ramani, one of yeah. uh, 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 the friends, like common friend that she did with a, a book called Mose. Uh, it was at the same time. Uh, yeah. uh, it was uh, she write a personal point of view of the Archie's uh, traumatic story in, in France. Mm -hmm. But the thing I, I like also a lot with the work of uh, of Zineb is that how she can handle all that story that is so heavy, so intense that we have like. Uh, really to take care of, uh, of uh, acting in a good way, uh, acting in a very uh, aware way, in a way that she do that with a very glamorous, playful, joyful way, and uh, always like full of color, and uh, that's, that's something that I 
I, I admire so much with uh, the with pops the because that's sent from the, what I was talking the heaviness of the archive, you know, the wearing of the glove mm -hmm. when you have to look through the documents and, mm -hmm. you know, all those things. And, you know, one way for me to kind of break out from those, and also the spaces often, they're quite, you know, I mean, they're beautiful, but they're like, and, uh, you know, the folders, everything, the way everything's archived, it's kind of very nerdy and very, so my way of perhaps breaking all that up is by putting colors and cutting through them and whatever. Um, but I mean, it's a good space to be in as an artist to be able to do that because yeah, I mean, I'm sure some people look at my archives and they're like, oh, sacrilege, mm -hmm. how could she do that, you know? That is, it's interesting because through poetry, through colors, through that mm -hmm. absolute glamour that mm -hmm. uh, Latifa, you, me you mentioned, I feel like your, your practice in it has, has really moved the needle when it comes to um, the narrative around Algeria in France. I mean, and I can really attest this from a personal point of view. I grew up in Marseille, a city which is completely shaped by the history of the colonies. My own family was involved in that story until I moved to the UK and I met Jean Fisher, who was an extraordinary post-colonial thinker. I just didn't know anything. And it's true that the English-speaking world, the American and, and British, have been much more advanced in terms of dealing theoretically with their colonial past. And in France, it remains a problem. But I think, I think what, where I was lucky is because I studied art and cultural studies and critical studies in the UK, mm -hmm. not in France. First of all, in France, there was no post-colonial studies in, 80, in the early 90s. It only happened with Zaya Rahmani, what, 15 years ago. But in England, it was starting already in the 80s huh, with the Black Art Movement. So I was lucky to come from that school of thought, feminism and post-colonial studies were my things. So automatically, and in that sense, I can see I'm very different from the French Algerian artists who look at post-colonial things. I deal with it in a very different way just because my, uh, I live also in Brixton. I mean, I'm totally, I'm, 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 I've got a distance also from France and Algeria because I live in the UK, so automatically I feel and see things differently. Mm -hmm. um, and hence why perhaps it was problematic for some people that I was representing France. Not only was I living in the UK, I was also Algerian. Uh, you know. But I think, I mean, bo in both your cases, as cases, I mean, obviously, Latifa, you're French from Moroccan descent, you live in Vervey in Switzerland, so in a way, I think that the, your both nomination was a wonderful lesson of, like, how we also need to yeah. uh, perhaps let go of these national barriers exactly. in Venice and, and, and beyond, hence why my project in Venice had to be about celebration. I was going to celebrate France choosing me. I wasn't going to keep saying, I'm the first Algerian, I'm the fourth woman, blah, blah, blah. I just thought, this is, it's been done. Let's not look at what they haven't done. They've done it now. They invited a French person from an immigrant background. Let's celebrate that. And the whole project, actually, it's about celebration. It's about dancing. It's about, you know. Well, like, a Looking huge up. congratulation to you both. I mean, both pavilions are extraordinary successes and a great, great joy to, to visit them both earlier in the year. I invite you all to go and see it. If you haven't, it's a really special biennial this year and in no small part to thanks to you both. And um, Emily, if we don't have any questions, I think we can... Well, in that case, I will thank you, very, thank you again very, very much. It was a real pleasure to be, um, to be in a conversation with you both. Um, thank you. All the best. And thank you, Latifa, for the friendship. Thank you.